Hello, this is Jay Kemmerly, and joining me on air is Dr. Jennifer Price. Dr. Price is in the Gastroenterology and Hepatology Division at Johns Hopkins University, an author of a review article appearing in the December issue of Clinical Gastroenterology and Hepatology entitled Liver Disease in the HIV-Infected Individual. Dr. Price, your review article goes through many of the liver diseases that we see in patients who have HIV infections such as hepatitis C and HIV co-infection. Yes, that's true. Since highly active antiretroviral therapy became widely available, at least in economically developed countries, at least in the uh, mid-1990s, um, there's been a very dramatic decrease in AIDS-related mortality and a very dramatic increase in the survival among patients with HIV. But on the flip side of this, as patients with HIV are now living much longer, the sequelae of other chronic diseases, such as liver disease, have been, become much more important in this population. Um, and as you mentioned, liver disease is now the most common non-AIDS-related cause of death in, in the United States. And um, so compared to the pre-heart era, the relative burden of liver disease in, of, in HIV infection is higher. And also compared to the pre-heart era, the spectrum of liver diseases that we're likely to encounter among people with HIV has changed. So, for instance, in the pre-heart era, opportunistic infections involving the liver were much more common, as were AIDS-related neoplasms that infiltrated the liver. Um, and now in the heart era, these diseases are still encountered, but with a much lower frequency. And now the majority of the morbidity and mortality due to liver disease in people with HIV is due to concomitant viral hepatitis um, and hepatitis C virus and HIV co-infection. Um, is one of the major uh, players uh, currently. In terms of uh, HIV and, and hepatitis C co-infection, as you can imagine, um, due to shared risk factors, co-infection is with uh, hepatitis C is quite common among people with, with HIV. And the specific prevalence rates vary depending on the particular population that you're looking at and what their risk for was for acquiring HIV. But as you can imagine, people who acquired HIV through injection drug use have extremely high rates of hep C co-infection, upwards of, of 90%. But overall in the U.S., approximately 30% of people who have HIV also have hepatitis C virus co-infection. Would you recommend that all patients who are identified with HIV infection be tested for a coincident hepatitis C infection? Yes, absolutely. So anybody who has HIV infection should be screened for both hepatitis C virus and hepatitis B virus. And um, we recommend screening for hepatitis C virus using a third-generation enzyme immunoassay for the hepatitis C antibody. And this generally is sufficient, sufficient for screening because it's highly sensitive even in the, in the setting of HIV infection. If the hepatitis C antibody is positive, then patients should go on to get quantitative RNA testing. And there are some situations in which you'd want to proceed with RNA testing, even if the antibody results are negative. So for a patient with significant risk factors for hepatitis C and advanced immunosuppression, then you might have a false negative hepatitis C antibody screen, and you'd want to proceed with RNA testing. And you'd also want to uh, perform hepatitis C RNA testing in anyone in whom you suspect acute hepatitis C infection. So what would sway your decision to treat an HCV infection in an HIV co-infected patient? Well, that, that's actually um, that's an important question. Uh, the the treatment, treatment regimen for both is the same. It involves peclatid interferon and ribavirin, but the treatment is less effective in, in people with HIV. Um, that being said, the, the, the decreased effectiveness uh, of, the, of the therapy shouldn't preclude attempting treatment. Um, but really, the, the benefits of, of treatment have to be weighed against the safety and efficacy concerns. And so the treatment, the, the decision to treat hepatitis C in someone with uh, HIV infection really needs to be made on an individual basis. Um, anybody who has decompensated cirrhosis should not receive treatment because of the, the, the safety concerns. Otherwise, it's reasonable to consider treatment in patients who have portal fibrosis or more advanced disease of biopsy. Um, as well as people who have acute hepatitis C infection and um, childbearing age women who might want to uh, be treated before becoming pregnant. Um, compared to treating hepatitis C mono infection, there are a few extra considerations to be made when starting hepatitis C treatment. One is that, in general, HIV treatment should be optimized pro prior to starting hepatitis C treatment. 
and I know for guidelines on this, but usually people wait at least several months before starting hepatitis C treatment. And um, another um, consideration is that certain HIV medications are contraindicated in the setting of ribavirin use, and the details of this can be found in the text of the article. What about hepatitis B infection? Is that also common in the HIV population? That is common in the HIV population, again, because of shared risk factors. So um, people who have acquired their HIV via high-risk sexual behaviors are also at higher risk of acquiring hepatitis B virus. And uh, overall, uh, approximately 5 to 8% of people with HIV infection in the United States also have uh, co-infection with hepatitis B virus. And in both of these populations, the thought of the development of hepatitis cellular carcinoma is an important consideration and appropriate um, screening and surveillance. Yes, that's true. So HIV affects the natural history of both hepatitis C and hepatitis B virus in several important ways. And compared to viral hepatitis mono-infected individuals, people who have HIV infection, once they're acutely infected with viral hepatitis, they're less likely to clear their acute infection. And then once they're chronically infected, they're less likely to spontaneously clear their infection. And also once chronically infected, they have an accelerated progression of fibrosis and an increased risk of developing cirrhosis. Once they're cirrhotic, they also have an increased risk of decompensated liver disease and death. Now, whether or not they have an increased risk of developing hepatocellular carcinoma compared to cirrhotic patients with viral hepatitis mono infection isn't clear. But we do know that the incidence of HCC is increasing among people with HIV, so they should be screened for hepatocellular carcinoma in the same way that you would screen a mono-infected patient with a patient who is mono-infected with viral hepatitis. Changing gears a little bit, in patients who are receiving antiretroviral therapy for their HIV infection, they also can experience liver toxicity from those medications, and there are a number of those that one has to think about. Yes, that's true. Liver toxicity is one of the most common serious adverse events associated with antiretroviral therapy, and the presentation can range from mild asymptomatic increases in serum transaminases to overt liver failure, and the time course can range from soon after starting treatment to several months. And although all antiretroviral drugs have some risk of hepatotoxicity. Some are um, implicated more than others, and classes of drugs have typical patterns of injury. It, it is impossible to go through all of the possible offenders during this brief interview, but I'd encourage viewers who are interested to read tables two through four um, in the article for details. But briefly, there are four primary mechanisms by which the antiretroviral therapy can lead to liver damage. Um, the first is direct drug toxicity, and almost all of the antiretroviral meds can cause this. Um, the onset is weeks to months, and the presentation can range from a mild asymptomatic transaminitis to clinical hepatitis. Uh, the second mechanism is hypersensitivity reaction, and this is associated with certain drugs, such as nevirapine. And the greatest risk is in the first six weeks of treatment, but it, it can present through four months into treatment. And that has clinical manifestations of a, a, abrupt onset of flu-like symptoms, abdominal pain, jaundice, and fever, and it may or may not have a characteristic skin rash. Uh, the third is mitochondrial toxicity, which is generally associated with the nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, the NRTIs. And this can develop anywhere from weeks to months after starting treatment and is associated with a lactic acidosis. And the fourth is something called immune reconstitution and plasma, or IRIS. And Iris is the, it's, it's the paradoxical worsening of a pre-existing infectious disease and the setting of successful HIV RNA suppression. So any uh, antiretroviral medication can be associated with iris because the syndrome is actually due to the rapid immune restoration rather than the actual medication interactions. And it's important to consider in people with underlying viral hepatitis, like hepatitis B or hepatitis C, who are um, recently started on antiretroviral therapy. Patients with HIV infections also are subject to alcoholic liver disease and non-alcoholic hepatic liver disease. How big of a problem is that in that population? Well, that's a good question, and it, it's not entirely clear. In terms of the um, alcoholic liver disease, the, the prevalence of alcoholic hepatitis or alcoholic cirrhosis among the HIV-infected population it isn't well-defined. 
and but some studies suggest that heavy drinking is more common among HIV HIV infected cohorts compared to the general population. So um, this is important because this may be an overlooked modifiable risk factor for liver disease that physicians should keep on their radar when assessing liver disease in patients with HIV. In terms of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, as many people know, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is uh, very common in the general population and it appears to also be quite prevalent among people with HIV. And people with HIV may be at an even higher risk of, of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease because of the metabolic abnormalities associated with their medications and with the HIV virus itself. And lastly, the HIV infection is a setup for a variety of direct liver diseases, things like AIDS clangiopathy, for instance. Mm -hmm. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about how to approach that in their algorithm of treatment? Sure. So generally, when I think about the algorithm of treatment with someone with, with HIV infection, um, I approach it in terms of um, non-HIV-related uh, liver diseases and uh, HIV-related liver diseases. And the non so the non-HIV-related liver diseases are um, the usual offenders that we think about in anybody, uh, regardless of HIV status, who have liver disease, like alcohol, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, hemochromatosis, et cetera. In terms of the HIV-related liver diseases, one thing that really helps you guide uh, your differential diagnosis is um, the patient's clinical scenario and their, um, the degree of their control of their HIV infection. So people whose HIV infection is, is well controlled um, and have high CD4 counts and, and low viral loads, in general, it's unlikely for you to see some of the AIDS-related opportunistic infections with a uh, notable exception of mycobacterium tuberculosis, which has been reported to involve the liver in people with HIV, even with high CD4 counts. So, um, in people with poorly controlled HIV and low CD4 counts, um, then the differential diagnosis includes many of the entities that were much more common causes of liver disease and HIV during the pre-heart era, including um, opportunistic infections, AIDS-related neoplasms, and AIDS clangiopathy, as you mentioned. So in terms of approaching um, the workup of these patients, one thing to look at is the, the pattern of LFT abnormalities. But in a lot of these patients, you'll have a cholestatic picture with very high um, alkaline phosphatase levels. Um, and that's, that's what's classic for AIDS clangiopathy, um, which is an entity characterized by infection-related strictures in the biliary tract that lead to biliary obstruction. And it's due to underlying um, infection from things like cryptosporidium or CMV. But you also get very high uh, alkaline phosphatase levels with um, opportunistic infections like mycobacterium avium. So um, imaging can be, can be useful. Um, Non-invasive imaging with ultrasound or MRCP can help to see if there's any um, dilated extra or intrahepatic biliary ducts, which would be associated with AIDS cholangiopathy. But um, ERCP is often the gold standard for diagnosing um, AIDS cholangiopathy, and it, it can be partially therapeutic with sphincterotomy. If you've ruled out AIDS cholangiopathy um, as a cause of the liver disease, um, in that case, sometimes liver biopsy can be helpful in establishing the, the diagnosis. And for people who have very high elevated elevations in their alkaline phosphatase, um, and advanced HIV, the liver biopsy may show granulomas in about 50% of cases, and in many of those, the organism may be seen on the biopsy. Dr. Price, in summary, what is the take-home message you'd like our listeners to have from this discussion? Well, I think the take-home points I'd, I'd, I'd like the listeners to have is that uh, liver disease is an important problem in the, the management of patients with HIV in the heart era. Um, that the majority of liver-related morbidity and mortality among people with HIV is due to viral hepatitis co-infection. Uh, co-infection with HIV and viral hepatitis is associated with more aggressive liver disease progression than viral hepatitis mono-infection. So diagnosing these patients and treating their hepatitis when indicated is very important. But even in the absence of viral hepatitis co-infection, people with HIV often have liver function test abnormalities. So if their HIV is poorly controlled, their LFT abnormalities may be from one of a number of AIDS-associated liver diseases, including opportunistic infections, neoplasms, and AIDS clangiopathy. Um, if their HIV is well-controlled, then you should consider medication toxicity, alcohol abuse, 
NAFL, and other non-HIV causes of liver disease. And then finally, I think we're likely to see more research in the future on the role of alcohol and NAFL on the development of liver disease among patients with HIV.